Genesis chapter 43. We're resuming the story of Joseph and his brothers. And we're coming to a point where the brothers are almost there. They recognize their sinful condition, their self-righteousness. Remember, that has always been their issue. Greatly pictures today's age. People having self-righteousness and sin. That's their issue. That's why they'll, they won't get saved. So Joseph's brothers pretty much pictures today's generation. They're almost there, but they're quite not saved yet. Meaning that, uh, I don't mean like their salvation, but in other words, a picture, a picture of a person who's almost saved, but not quite there because of their self-righteousness and sin holding them back. Uh, Joseph, he pictures Jesus Christ. The brothers, they're getting under conviction. They're being dealt with. They're getting closer. They're getting closer to Joseph, closer to reconciliation, but not quite there yet. And then Benjamin is finally brought and introduced to the scene. And we're going to see some interesting pictures of what Benjamin represent. Joseph's brothers represent sinners today. Benjamin represents actually an even more gloomy picture a more gloomy picture, but actually it's a positive reference at the same time. We're going to be covering Joseph where, where he confronts his brothers. Where we last left off is Genesis chapter 43 and verse 29, 29. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? So then Joseph, uh, he sees his brothers bowing down before him at verse 28. Then as Joseph looks at that scenery of his brothers kneeling, Joseph lifts up his eyes. So then he looks, that's the idea, that's a phrase meaning that he looks or he pay attentions or he uh, focuses on the part of his brother. He sees his brother, Benjamin. Benjamin is his mother's son. He says to Benjamin, uh, he says to the brothers, is this your younger brother that you to told me about? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. So Joseph, he says, he gives a blessing to ben Benjamin, saying, God be gracious unto you, my son. Verse 30, and Joseph made haste, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept there. So Joseph, he hurriedly went out because his inward, uh, inwardly, he yearned, he longed for his brother. That's what bowels are referring to, his inward part, inwardly. Yearn is the idea about desiring, desiring for his younger brother because it's been so many years. And then he was trying to search for a place to cry. That way the brothers don't realize who he is or wonder what's going on. And then he went to his bedchamber, his bedroom, and then he cried over there. Verse 31, And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. So then he washed his face, got rid of the tears, made sure that uh, he looked serious. That's why the verse said he refrained himself. So he uh, kept back his tears. He went outside to his brothers and then gave the command to set on bread, prepare the meals, uh, set up the meal so that we can all eat together. There is a picture here concerning Benjamin. If you look at verse 34, that is the first clue where we can discover his picture. Verse 34, notice right here, and he took and sent messes unto them from before him, but Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. Benjamin, he received five times the meal, okay? Five times the meal. Now, if you know your Bible, what does five represent? It represents death. So there's something to Benjamin that signifies death. And there is no doubt about it when you look at uh, Genesis. Go to Genesis uh, 35. Genesis 35. 
All right, we're going to go to the book of Genesis and then chapter 35. Chapter 35. Notice right here in Genesis chapter 35, and then we'll look at verse, let's see right here, verse 18, verse 18. And it came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. Notice that when Rachel died, she gave birth to Benjamin, right? So Benjamin was born from death. Benjamin was born from death. So there's no doubt Benjamin is tied to death. A second reason is based on his name itself, believe it or not. Now his name is Benjamin, but when his mother died... Her mother, uh, his mother, originally called him Benoni. Now, what does Benoni mean? It means son of sorrow, meaning that she gave birth to him from sorrow. She died, remember. Rachel died through sorrow. So it was through her death she gave birth, a sorrowful death that she gave birth to Benjamin. That's why she named him that. His name is based upon the sorrowful death. So his name itself is tied to death. Benjamin is clearly connected to death. Now, what does that have to do with Joseph being Jesus Christ when we go back to Genesis 43? In Genesis 43, remember, Joseph is Jesus. Now look at this. This will automatically uh, answer the scene here. Why is Benjamin connected to death? Joseph yearned. He longed to meet his brother Benjamin, right? The meeting here must happen. The idea is the meeting must happen. This is something that Joseph waited for for a long time. Jesus Christ waited for a very long time, for this meeting that has to happen, that must happen, his encounter with death. Why is that? That was his whole purpose for coming down, is to die, his whole mission. Think about Joseph. The entire purpose of his mission, where he sent his brothers away and then jailed Simeon, wanted to bring back who? Benjamin. That was his whole purpose and mission was for Benjamin. Jesus Christ's whole purpose and mission was for death, to die. See, there's a huge connection here. That's the reason why Benjamin is somehow representing or tied to death. Here are some interesting notions. Is that when we look at Genesis chapter 43 and then verse 30... Joseph, when he encounters Benjamin, he weeps. Jesus Christ, when he encounters his time of death or the crucifixion, the Bible says he wept. Go to Hebrews 5. Go to the book of Hebrews. Now, that did not mean that Jesus Christ, that he was a chicken and Oh, I'm afraid of getting tortured. I'm afraid to die. No, that's not the idea. What he was afraid of during his time of death or the crucifixion was to take the wrath of God upon himself, the sins of all mankind. That was the reason why he was crying. That's the reason what he dreaded. It wasn't to die. It wasn't to get killed. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. Notice in verse 7 about Jesus Christ, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Look at that. So notice right here in Jesus' encounter with death, that's where he couldn't keep himself and couldn't refrain himself, and he cried. Joseph, he couldn't keep himself in. He couldn't refrain himself, and he cried when he encountered Benjamin. So there's no doubt there's a connection here. Interesting. Another one is we go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John 
John chapter 20. Here's another interesting thing. When Jesus died, his death is connected to five. The proof was his deadly marks. His deadly marks. Two nails on his hand, two nails on his feet, and then a spear thrust in his side. That's five in total. In John chapter 20 and verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Jesus Christ rep uh, presents it at verse 27. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So Jesus Christ had five deadly marks. Jesus Christ gave five deadly marks for death to eat to claim from him. Joseph gave five meals to Benjamin to claim to eat. Right? Genesis, go back. Jesus gives five marks to death. Joseph gives five meals to Benjamin. How about that? Connection there. Uh, Genesis 43, verse 34. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him, but Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. He received five. So there's a connection with Benjamin, the tears, the five meals, death, and Jesus Christ. A lot of interesting stuff that we learned here. All right, now continuing on in Genesis 43. Let me know if I'm cut out of bounds. All right. Continuing on, verse 32. And they said on for him by himself, and for them by themselves, and for the Egyptians which did eat with him by themselves. So notice in this verse that when they set up the meal, they set up the meal for Joseph where he was eating on, in a table by himself, for the brothers by themselves with their own table, and the Egyptians who did eat with Joseph, they sat in separate tables by themselves. Notice the next part of verse 32. Because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now notice how racist this passage is, all right? And it's not white people with black people, it's black people uh, with the Jews. How about that? Isn't that funny? You heard that in public schools before? No, they won't tell you that. Always picking on the white people for segregation. Well, newsflash, if you study history, every single race did segregation. Every single race, all right? It's not just the white. If you look at verse 32, the idea is the Egyptians will not eat bread. They will not eat together with the Hebrews. Why? That's an abomination to them. All right, that's pretty hateful. That's pretty racist. So notice that uh, one of the uh, beginning passages on segregation has to do with uh, Black Lives Matter against white people. Oh, wait a minute. It is practice today. They get that, what, the P Black Panther movie out, and then I think it's UC Santa Barbara. They mention, we, we ask that no white person would participate in this movie meeting, only black people. You know, that's segregated. Look at this, man. Yeah, that is racist. So what's going on right here? No different from today's time. No different from today's time. Egypt is still being played out in today's day and age. All right, verse 33, verse 33. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another. Notice right here that... Uh, as they sat in front of the presence of Joseph, the oldest person was sitting at his seat. That was according to his birthright. The youngest person was sitting in his seat according to his youth. So from the birthright to the youth, from the eldest to the youngest, they were seated in sequence. So then the men obviously were wondering. They were surprised at each other. How did the governor know that? So you betcha that they were afraid after that. They first get the money in their sacks. That scared them. 
and now they're sitting in order according to birth, that really scares them. That really scares them. Verse 34, And he took and sent messes unto them from before him. So Joseph uh, took and sent out the meals to the brothers uh, from his presence. Now notice that the King James Bible is so archaic, I mean, no one understands what messes mean, that the military should uh, change uh, what they call the mess hall, right? No one knows what the mess hall is, you know? Why don't you call it the kitchen, you know? Why, everyone knows what a mess hall is. That's where you're going to eat. So what do you mean it's so archaic that we have to update a King James Bible word right here? Like I told you so many times, when people claim that there's an archaic word in the King James Bible, you'd be surprised in these modern times, those words are still used. Those words are still used. So don't let them fool you with that, okay? All right, continuing on in verse 34. But Benjamin's mess was five times... Uh, let me turn the page here. If I'm hearing turning of pages, I know you got a Ruckman reference Bible. All right. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. Meaning that Benjamin's uh, meal was five times uh, as much as the other brothers, and they all drank and were merry uh, with Joseph that time. So they were enjoying together. It's a picture right here of a sinner who gets saved, and then is able to enjoy the meal with his Lord. So look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19. And then go to Luke 15. Luke 15. Revelation 19. And then Luke 15. Notice we see the picture of a sinner who gets saved and then is able to enjoy the meal with Christ or with his Lord. And they're able to make merry. Look at Revelation 19. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 and verse... Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. See, making Mary right here. And give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath, also, hath made herself ready. Notice right here, verse 9, 9, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're feasting. They're eating and drinking. Look at Luke 15. Luke 15. Notice right here in verse 27, 27, the story of the prodigal son. The father prepares a meal and makes merry for the prodigal son, picturing the Lord... Uh, preparing the meal, making merry, concerning the saved sinner. Luke 15, 27, And he said unto them, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted cat, because he hath received him safe and sound. Safe, like saved. Look at verse 29, 29. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou neverst gave me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. And notice that uh, the eldest, uh, the elder son in this story pointed out that they were making merry, that they were having a good time. So there is uh, merriment and there is meals concerning about a sinner who is able to come to Christ for salvation. All right, let's go to Genesis 43. Genesis 43. Now, before I continue on in chapter 44, we see here a picture of a sinner getting saved, right? We saw many of those. One was in verse 23. They try to pay for their salvation. But uh, no, it was already paid for them. It's a gift. Secondly, they're trying to pay for the bread to eat. Uh, Jesus Christ is the bread of life who gives salvation. So they try to pay for their bread to eat, but instead Jesus Christ, get, uh, Joseph gives them uh, the bread, picturing Jesus Christ giving them the bread for salvation, which is seen at John chapter 6, for example. We see another example of salvation where Jesus Christ receives death receives death. Why? 
because following the terms that death will come, then uh, you can be restore, restored, you can be saved. Joseph said, following the terms I received Benjamin, you guys can get saved, save yourselves by receiving this bread. So we see that example with Benjamin's case picturing death, Jesus Christ uh, receiving death at verse 29 and verse 30. We see another example of salvation where at verse uh, 26, uh, they were able to, let's see right here, uh, verse 24, excuse me, verse 24, that they were able to receive washing uh, from Joseph. Christ washes his saints' feet. We see a lot of pictures of salvation right here. Uh, verse 16, verse 16, notice that uh, Joseph sees his brothers coming and prepares the meal. Picturing salvation at Luke 15, the Lord sees the lost son returning and then prepares the meal. We see so many pictures of salvation. If this is a picture of salvation, here's something very interesting to note. This also pictures where th this is all a foretaste of salvation. But even though the sinners right here, they get some kind of foretaste or they get some kind of, uh, they, they touch the brim of salvation, they are not saved. Why is that? Because uh, brothers here, they still have self-righteousness. They still have their sin. So even though they're close to salvation, they're not. Now, I'm not, I don't mean this in a way to scare people from getting saved. Like, if you uh, touch salvation, then you are saved, all right? If you uh, receive Christ for salvation, salvation comes to you easily. I don't believe in something like you're really saved. No, there's no such thing. If you're saved, you're saved, all right? There's no such thing as halfway saved. But what I mean from this passage, if I use terms like really saved or on the brink of salvation or a foretaste, I don't mean it in a way uh, like you hear from other churches where salvation is not simple and that you have to really get into it. You have to be so serious. Your repentance have to be like all the way cleansing of your sins. Did you really believe on Christ for salvation? No, salvation is simple and you can just go through the basic little steps and that's enough. God will get you salvation. You're in, you're in. So when I use those terms about foretaste or on the brink, what I mean is this, is that they weren't saved to begin with, all right? They weren't saved to begin with, but they're almost there. They're almost there. There is such a thing when we look at the book of Acts, all right? We look at the books of, book of Acts. So they didn't even touch salvation at all. That's the idea. They weren't even in it to begin with. They weren't even in its borderline to begin with. Once you touch it, once you're in that borderline, boom, you're in, you're sucked in. That's what we believe in. Once you're saved, you're saved. But if you're not saved, that's what it means. You're not saved. You weren't even saved to begin with. That's the idea I meant. So if we look at one example right here, when we look at the book of Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, there is such a thing where a person is almost saved, but is not saved, is not there. Look at Acts chapter 26, verse 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. See that right there? So Agrippa almost got saved, but he didn't. Almost persuaded, but he wouldn't. So uh, we see that every day, right? You're leading a soul to Christ, you're witnessing, they're agreeing, and they're like believing, and then you're getting there, and then when you come to the sinner's prayer, they're just not ready yet, right? They just won't believe that much yet, right? They're not ready to. So that's a realistic thing about almost getting saved. Now look, if you've uh, confessed to Christ for your salvation, put your faith on him as a repentant sinner, guess what? You're done, all right? There's no such thing as really saved. Uh, let's see how really sincere you were and 
let's uh, make uh, you weren't saved to begin with. Oh, you're still struggling with these sin issues. I don't see fruit out of your life, so you weren't really saved. You didn't really repent of your sin. There's no such thing, all right? Once you've done that, confess to Christ as a repentant sinner, it's done, it's sealed. Amen. So I want to emphasize that over and over again. But I also want to teach that there is such a thing, if you've done so much soul winning, where a person don't even confess to Christ for salvation as a repentant sinner. They don't even do that. They won't even go there. A simple thing like that. A first step like that. They're almost, they keep hearing the gospel, you can see the conviction, but they won't. They won't. So there is such a thing as almost getting saved, but they would not get saved. That's a serious issue nowadays. We're going to look at 2 Peter. I want you to also look at 2 Peter. Chapter 2. Look at 2 Peter, chapter 2. Now, the book of 2 Peter, uh, there are Bible believers who teach this both ways. One is that it's a doctrinal application for a tribulation saint, uh, where losing salvation is a dangerous time. But also, it has another application, and Dr. Upman, he mentions this in his note, where it can apply to the church age, where a person has some kind of knowledge or some kind of uh, taste, so to speak. So excuse me when I use these terms. Please don't be so doctrinally correct that you, get, uh, that you become so wrong now, all right? That you become accusatory, all right? So you know what I mean. Just show me grace when I say this. When they uh, touch the brink of it, when they get a taste of salvation, that they don't actually get, go through with it. And then the Bible says it was best that they never knew it to begin with. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. We see right here that at verse 20, verse 20, 2 Peter 2, 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the, notice, knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So notice right here, it's a knowing, right? It's a knowing. So... Here's a knowing of how to be saved from your sins. Here's a knowing of that. Christ can give you salvation, life in Christ in heaven. So they have a knowing of that. But then what happened? They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Oh, that's pretty bad. Then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Well, that's pretty bad. The, the writer here, the author is saying, it was better that they had not known what the word of God said to begin with. It would have been better that they didn't know about salvation to begin with. Why? Because once they know about it, but they don't really go through with their salvation, then what happens is when, no, I refuse as a sinner I refuse as a sinner to receive Christ for my salvation, for Christ to save me from my sin, then what happens is, with that unrepentant, unbelieving attitude, then it gets worse for them. So when you preach to them the gospel the second time, it's, the conviction is not the same as before. Why? Because they already know. They already heard it before. So the conviction is not fresh or new to them. When you, sometimes when you give the gospel to the person the first time, you see the conviction on them, and then you wonder the second time when you follow up with them, they don't get as convicted, right? And you go, why is that? Because they already know that's the problem. So it was, would have been better that they didn't know to begin with. You know, that's a rampant problem in Baptist churches today. They hear about uh, the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but they don't go through with it. They don't actually confess to Christ as a repentant sinner that I trust the Lord Jesus Christ for my salvation. No, they just know about it. Jesus died to save me from my sins. How many people or Christians, so-called Christians, people who go to Baptist churches have you met who know about, who know about the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, but they actually didn't do it. They actually did not confess to Christ for their salvation. Those types of people are probably even worse to give the gospel to. Why? 
Because if you gave it to a fresh sinner, they'll admit, honestly, I don't know. I didn't know that before. Yeah, I want to get saved. Versus a person who grew up in a Christian church, oh, I already know that, and they didn't actually do it, and it's so hard to convince them to get saved. Sometimes it's worse. Good evidence of that is where you see some of these atheists, where you're surprised to hear their testimonies, they used to be in a Christian church. If they weren't saved to begin with, then it explains why they are hardcore atheists. Because they knew so much about Christianity, all about God, all about the gospel, so they wouldn't become an atheist unless they already knew about the gospel, but their experience in their life betrayed what they knew about Christianity. They wouldn't become an atheist unless they know the faults or the flaws or uh, they feel betrayed about Christianity. They, no one just becomes an atheist like that. Some do, but some don't. Some of them who don't, you'd be surprised to hear their testimony. They used to be in a Christian church or a Baptist church. What's that an example of? It's best that they didn't know to begin with. And their latter end became worse than the first. One of the champions of atheist arguments is actually Bart Ehrman. You know that? He's one of their champions. Why? Because he knows all the Bible stuff, all the Christian stuff, the arguments to debunk. How would he know that unless he was not in a Christian church to begin with? Christian seminary to begin with? Oh, guess what? He was. He was raised in a Christian home and in a Christian seminary where these d idiotic professors were doing textual criticism, the errors in your Bible. That helped Bart Ehrman to debunk Christianity. Best that they didn't know to begin with. All right, go to the book of Titus. This is very interesting. Go to Titus chapter, Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Actually, Titus chapter 1, verse 15 through 16. Titus chapter 1, verse 15 through 16. Titus chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Now, some people might use this passage to point out that this is referring to saved Christians who actually uh, have bad works. So then, because they have bad works, they lost their salvation, or they weren't really saved Christians to begin with. No, uh, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about believers here. It's talking about unbelievers who do bad works, who live in sin. Because notice in verse 15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and what? Unbelieving. So this passage is talking about unbelievers, not believers. Right. If you're a believer who messed up in sin, all right, this passage is not talking about you. Believers who mess up with sin, the, there are plenty of verses that show you're still a saved believer, but you lose rewards at the judgment or you reap what you sow or you're chastised. This passage is about unbelievers. So unbelievers, notice right here in verse 15, is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, right? Like 2 Peter 2? No. They profess, oh, I already know God. I am a Christian. I grew up in a Baptist church. I know the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. They profess they know, but look at their works, verse 16. But in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So they profess and they claim, oh, I already know God, I'm a safe Christian, I went to church and all that kind of stuff. No, but they actually didn't confess to Christ for salvation that they actually believed on him. How do I know that? Because verse 15 said unbelieving. See, so they actually didn't believe on Christ for salvation. So they didn't actually believe, but in verse 16, they just know. They just know. I, that's why I keep stressing this over and over again. I am so against people who are anti-sinner's prayer. All right? I am so against that. You might say, why is that? Because when you're giving them the gospel, they're knowing it, right? They're knowing it. So then uh, how, do you, how can you tell if they're going to actually believe on Christ for salvation unless they say it? When they say it, then at that moment, 
you're seeing that they're putting their belief on Christ. But if you don't see that, then all you're going to get is a profession, like verse 16. You're going to get a profession from people. Oh, yeah, yeah, I already believed on Christ, I already did that. Well, then when? How you know when is when there was a time and place that they actually confessed Christ, their belief. That's good mark. That's a good mark that you put your belief on Christ is when you confess it out of your mouth. But to never have that confession out of your mouth, it's hard to put a marker. See that? So then you don't know if there was actually belief in there or if it's just a mental thing. So some, and that's the dangerous thing about uh, salvation is you only have head knowledge rather than actual heart belief. That's a very dangerous thing. And so I don't believe in that thing. When you're anti-sinner's prayer, you're very, uh, you're very much leaning toward or paving a huge Pandora's box for just a mental knowledge of it, mental knowing of the gospel, rather than an actual heart belief. Uh, people will argue, well, they're just robotically doing the sinner's prayer. Well, then just, it's so simple. Tell them don't, uh, repeating uh, words in a prayer don't save you. That's it. It's that simple. That doesn't mean that you have to discourage it or get rid of the sinner's prayer. So if you see these bozos who have videos or write a book about, you know, uh, being against the sinner's prayer or stuff like that and draw on a whiteboard, I don't care if they profess to be Bible believer. That is heresy. Avoid those kind of people. And trust me, Bible believing pastors and churches avoid people like that. They avoid people like that. All right. So you better watch out for that. I don't believe in that because you're opening, opening up a Pandora's box of people who just profess that they know I, the gospel and all that. I already heard, I know, and stuff like that. That's a huge Pandora's box. I don't believe in that. Why is the sinner's prayer an actual heart belief? Because it is making them, at that moment when they repeat those words, to actually pay attention to the words they're saying and put their heart in every word to it. That's why we always say, uh, you got to mean it before you do the sinner's prayer. You got to put your heart in every word. Some, other times I'll say, pretend these are your words, not mine. There are other soul winners who will have those guys pray themselves without any help. So that's the sinner's prayer proves more of actual heart belief. See that when you do that? It's not robotic. It's not denying heart belief. No, it's actual heart belief when they're confessing it out of their mouth. Why? Because they mean every word. That's actual heart belief. Uh, there's, or they say the words themselves. That's actual heart belief. Versus just saying the gospel to them and they just know. See that? Then all you're going to get is a profession from them. Just a profession without an actual marking without an actual evidence or something concrete where they did the actual heart belief, all right? So that's very important. So you have to, uh, I, I totally disagree with being an anti-sinner's prayer, or if you claim you're not anti-sinner's prayer, to teach so much against sinner's prayer that you're discouraging people from using it. I'm totally against that. All right, now coming back right here, another important thing at verse 15 and 16 is remember this, A, B, C, and salvation, right? So there is no belief, but also there is no repentance. There is no repentance. That's why verse 15 says, but unto them that are not just unbelieving, but what? Them that are defiled and unbelieving. See, so they even skip the beginning stage of salvation acknowledging their sinful condition. Why? Because verse 15, the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled, nothing is pure. Their conscience defiled. See, there's no conviction. Rather, or even, perhaps, acknowledgement of their sinful condition at verse 15, you see. That's the idea. So that is Joseph's brother's problem. That's a picture of them, see? is that they actually, uh, in this case right here, there is no repentance on their part as a sinner. There is no repentance where they can put their whole trust upon the Savior to save them. No, there is no acknowledgement right here. You might say, how do you know that? Because they never told him that. 
They just say it to each other, doing a blame game, remember? That's the only time you'll hear acknowledgement of their sins is when they're blaming each other or they'll say, oh, what is God doing to us? Or they're under fear because God is punishing to them. But there is no actual conviction here. I am wrong for what I did. I acknowledge that. There is nothing like that in the book of Genesis. It's just a blame game on each other. I told you not to do that to our brother Joseph. Because of this bad thing, the Lord is punishing us. That's all they're doing. That's all they're doing. Rather than we have sinned, we acknowledge it, we are wrong, I am sorry. Nothing like that. If, because they never said that to the governor. So that shows they're hiding their sin still. See that? They're prideful. All right, let's go to... Uh, so we've seen an example of almost salvation. Now let's go to... Uh, we'll go back to Genesis. We'll go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 43. So what we see here then is this. In Genesis 43, summing up again, it's all a picture of salvation, right? Washing the feet, eating the meal, uh, the encounter with death, etc. But the brothers, they're only, uh, they're only at the borderline. They're only almost. See, that's a great picture of that. In spite of all of that, they're not saved. There's just a knowledge of that. Just a knowledge. Just uh, on the borderline, the brink. Not actually being in there. So here they are. They're drinking, being merry. They're trying to pay back uh, the sack. They're enjoying the blessings. They receive this uh, salvation uh, from their brother Joseph. And then they bring Benjamin. But uh, right there, there's, uh, there's still that self-righteousness in there. There's still that sin issue that's still in there. So it's a good picture of people where they attend a Baptist church. They attend a church with their Christian family. They pray along with them. They know about the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. They might even pair that to other people, but they weren't actually saved to begin with. It's a great picture of that in Genesis 43. That is a great... Uh, I strongly believe we see a lot of that in our so-called Christian churches today. The evidence is when I talk to so-called people, uh, so-called Christians in so-called Christian churches. I ask them, uh, when did you get saved? How did you get saved? And when you hear their testimony, they don't give a testimony of salvation. It's like I always grew up this way. I was born this way. I uh, served God in a church. I was a missionary. And you see that? That self-righteousness still in there. There's no testimony of their sinful condition where they came to Christ as a repentant sinner and he saves them from that. that so Genesis 43, the Joseph's brothers pictures those professing Christians. Not saved Christians, but professing Christians. That's, uh, that's a real thing because in Matthew... Um, uh, we won't turn to this passage, but that's a real thing because in Matthew 13, the Bible says Jesus Christ is going to separate the tares from the wheat because they're mingled together. So you have to realize amongst Christians today or Christian churches, we get that uh, tear mingled with the wheat that you can't tell. If you ever saw a wheat or a tear at the beginning stages, you can't really tell the difference until the so-called fruit comes out. The fruit comes out. That's why Jesus said, by their fruits ye shall know them, actually. All right, but anyway, that's a real thing. Joseph Brothers pictures professing Christians. So let's put that up, all right? Not actually saved Christians, but professing Christians. That's a real thing. That's a doctrinal thing. That's why um, in this church, we take salvation very seriously. Um, when we do... Baptism, we just don't baptize easily. We want to make sure your salvation is genuine. We follow up on your salvation. Now, look, if you are saved, we're not going to talk you out of your salvation, all right? Uh, we don't believe in that. But we do believe in making sure. 
wouldn't, uh, would, I, would I be offended or would I be thankful? I would be thankful yeah. that someone cares for me that I would go to heaven after I die and make sure my salvation is genuine. So I wouldn't feel like, oh, you're offending me or I'm feeling interrogated. And that's how sensitive people feel. You know why? They want to stick to their profession. That's their problem. That's like sticking to your self-righteousness, hiding your sin issue like Joseph's brothers. I don't believe in that. I would be thankful if someone made sure that I'm going to heaven after I die. Who would be upset? Would be upset. Only today's generations would be upset because we're so used to the liberal, sensitive environment. Sensitive to each other's feelings. Stop, you know, just stop, man. All right, Genesis 44, verse 1. All right, enough, enough of that. Verse 1. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money, and he did according to the word that Joseph has spoken. All right, explaining each and every word from these two verses, it goes like this. And Joseph, he commands the steward of his house, the one in charge of taking care of his household. He, tells, uh, he says these words to him. I want you to fill all the men's sacks, their bags with food again, as much as they can carry. Just overflow it. Fill it to the brim. And make sure you put their money back in the sack's mouth, in the, bags, uh, in the opening of the bag again. And I want you, in addition, put my cup in there, my silver cup, in the, bat, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, in Benjamin's uh, bag. You're going to put in the entrance of that bag there. And also put back uh, the money he paid for the corn. Or corn, meaning, remember here, it's referring to the grain. It's referring to the bread. And then the steward followed the words that Joseph spoke to him. He followed his commands. Verse 3, as soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses. And when they were gone out of the city and not yet far off, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? All right, so total change of scenery, all right? He tells the servant, I want you to uh, put my cup in the bag. And then the very next day, Joseph says at verse 3, each and every word as I explain it, soon as daylight comes, the men were sent away. They were able to go back home, uh, them and their animals or their donkeys. As soon as they're gone out of the city and they weren't far away from it, Joseph says to his steward, all of a sudden, go after the men. When you overtake them, when you catch up with them, I want you to say to them, why did you... Uh, pay me evil, why did you treat me uh, so, uh, why did you mistreat me after all the good that I treated you? That's the idea. Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Verse 5, is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed, indeed he divineth? Ye have done evil in so doing. So Joseph wants his steward to tell them that isn't this the cup that my Lord drinks out from? And truly also something that he divine it. The idea is that's where uh, it's the same thing where some people don't know what divine means or divinity. It's not just referring to God, but it's referring to anything that has to refer to gods or it has to do, uh, oh, oh man, uh, divination, right? Divination. So that's all tied together. Fortune telling. That's what divineth is referring to, the occultic stuff. So Joseph also continues on to the steward. Make sure you tell them that you've done evil in doing this because this is a very precious cup to me. Now, uh, the interesting note that Dr. Upman puts right here, uh, he says in, chap uh, in like, sub if you'll notice right here, footnote A, in chapter 44, from this comes the custom in the old Anglican church to give a newborn child a silver cup on his first birthday. The cup goes into the sack of the youngest boy. Huh, that's kind of interesting. Another thing that he notes 
in footnote one, if you look down there, footnote one, Dr. Upman explains, notice how famous a cup gets. Merlin the magician had one. See, it all connects to divination, connects to magic. Alexander the Great had one. And the Catholic Church made such a fuss over the Holy Grail during the Dark Ages that Sir Galahad had his hands full. It was Roman Catholics who decided they could reproduce the contents of a cup out at an altar. See, why, what is it with magic connected to cups, right? That even the Catholics would think that there's something special about a cup, some kind of magic thing, weird stuff. Uh, we see this case about uh, divination connected to fortune telling at Acts 16. When we go to Acts 16... So during those times, the pagans, or especially pagan rulers, they would take these cups or objects and then try to divine the future, do fortune telling, do some kind of magic with it. That's actually a real thing. It is said that Alexander the Great also had one as well. Acts chapter 16 Let's see, Acts chapter 16. We'll notice right here that at verse 16, verse 16, and it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of what? Divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by what? Susang. So notice right here that fortune telling is connected to divinity, divine, divination. They're all the same bunch. Look at 1 Samuel 28. 1 Samuel 28. Notice that King Saul went to the witch of Endor to bring up Samuel from the dead. It's all connected to that. 1 Samuel chapter 28. Look at verse 8. 1 Samuel 28, 8. Notice that divine right here is connected to witchcraft. It's not necessarily referring to God only or the true God. For Samuel 28, 8, and Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit. Oh, how about that? You can divine a familiar spirit. All right, going back to Genesis 43. Genesis 43. That was the real thing during those days. Because remember, Joseph is from the Egyptian culture. So that was a real thing. That was a real thing. Look at Genesis chapter 43. Oh, 44, excuse me. Thank you. 44, yeah. 44. And then we'll look at verse 6. Verse 6. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to this thing. Behold, the money which we found in our sack's mouths, we brought... Again, unto thee out of the land of Canaan, how then should we steal out of thy Lord's house silver or gold? So, uh, let me explain each and every word from verse 6 through 8. So, Joseph over, uh, no, excuse me, the steward overtakes or catches up with the, uh, catches up with the brothers, and then he spoke to them the same words that Joseph instructed him to tell them. And then the, uh, Joseph's brothers say, to the steward at verse 7. Uh, why would my Lord say these words to us? This is pretty harsh, an accusation. God forbid. So that's a phrase like, no way we would do it. God forbid that the Lord, thy Lord's servants, that your servants would do such a crime like this. Hey, look, that's what behold is meaning. Again, we've seen that so many times. The money which we found in our bags, we brought it again to you out of the land of Canaan. Do you remember that? We restored it. So how, how is it that we would steal from your Lord's house silver or gold? So remember, they were accusing him of stealing the silver cup. So they're saying, it doesn't make sense we would steal the silver cup if we even gave back the money to you at the beginning. Wouldn't it make sense? We're honest people. Verse 9, With whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my, uh, my Lord's bondmen. And notice that Joseph's brothers, uh, 
they were so daring. They, they said, with any, with any of your servants here, if you find that silver cup, let that person die where you find that silver cup. And the remainder of us will become uh, our, your Lord's slaves. Verse 10, the steward said, and he said, now also let it be according unto your words, he with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. The steward says, okay, so let it be according to your words. Uh, we're going to, what you said, all right, keep your words. We're going to do it then. However, the thing is this, is that the person that we find the silver cup will be the servant, will be the slave. The rest of you can be free. You'll be blameless. You'll be innocent. Verse 11, then they speedily took down every man his sack to the ground and opened every man his sack. And he searched and began at the eldest and left at the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. And then they rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned unto the city. How sad. All right, what, what each and every word means from 11 to 13 is they, in, a, in great speed, in a rush, because they wanted to get this over with. They wanted to prove their innocence, their righteousness. Each and every man took the, took the bag out of the ground and then opened up the bag, and then the steward searched in every bag, starting from the oldest person and then going finally to the youngest. And then when they reached the youngest, they found the cup in Benjamin's bag. <coughs> the brothers, when they saw this, they tore their clothes I mean, they just rent their clothes. That's a sign of mourning or great distress. That was, that was a cultural thing that time. They would just tear their clothes. And then they loaded. That's what laded means. They loaded the sacks uh, or the bags, every person back to their donkey, and then they return back to the city in Egypt. All right, go to Romans 2, and we'll close it here. Romans 2, and then we'll close it here. You know what this is a great example of? This is a great example of man's self-righteousness. You know what? The brothers, they thought that they're not guilty with their sin. Because why? We gave the money back, remember? We're good, honest people. But then, when the steward searches everything, he actually finds the guilty, uh, the guilty thing and then proves them guilty and then uh, they're in mourning. They're in great grief. They're caught with uh, the guilt, caught with the crime. There is no escape from it. Even though they dared and they challenged at the beginning, check our righteousness. We're good people. There's no way that you're going to catch us with something wrong. Oh, really? It's today's generations. Today's generations professing Christians or professing, say, people like, uh, hey, uh, remember how I paid it back? I've done good works. You see how good of a person I am? How can you accuse me of being a sinner? There's no way I'm a sinner. I'm a good person. I love Jesus. I serve God. I've done so many wonderful things. But then when you get the Holy Spirit searching, Search in all your works and all your life. He's going to catch you with the sin and prove you guilty. Prove to you that you are caught with the crime and that you are truly guilty. The steward can represent here and picture the Holy Ghost. Just like Abraham's steward uh, pictured the Holy Ghost in getting a bride for Isaac, right? So the steward here in this passage can picture the Holy Ghost. Now we look at Romans 2. We look at Romans 2. Notice right here in verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew and resteth in the law and makest thy boast of God and knowest his will and approvest the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law and art confident, right? Like Joseph's brothers, they're so confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. So they're conf the Jews are confident in their self-righteousness in keeping the morals, like Joseph's brother. But Paul points out their hypocrisy. Verse 21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself, thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Verse 23, Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. Verse 23, 
6, 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? So Paul is pointing out that, hey, don't be a hypocrite. You say that uh, you keep the law. You boast about it. But when the law really checks you out, when God checks you out with the law, we're going to catch you with some things that you broke. So don't be a hypocrite. And if everyone's honest. Everybody broke the law before. Everybody broke the law of God before. So that is a great picture of a professing believer. Today's day and age, there's no doubt about that. No doubt about it. Uh, Joseph's brothers greatly picture that. Probably one of the greatest uh, stories to picture professing uh, believers would be Genesis 42 and 43. Father God, I pray that today's Genesis study has been eye-opening to today's day and age and what we can learn from it and anyone out there who may be a professing Christian, Lord, or professing believer, may you open their eyes, make them see the need of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they will actually put their belief and trust upon Christ for salvation as confessing as a repentant sinner. And uh, I pray that you'll bless the remaining time together in fellowship and everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.